You're listening to Ramadan Reflections by Mufti Hussein Kamani. This summer, Mufti Hussein will be teaching the Hadith Intensive. Students will study the different methods of compilation and preservation of a Hadith. The major role female scholars have played in Hadith preservation, the biography of famous Hadith narrators, as well as different Hadith collections and excerpts from famous Hadith texts like Sahih al-Bukhari. For more information, visit hadithintensive.com. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salamun ala ibadihi al-ladhin astafa. Khususan ala Sayyidi Rasuli wa Khatim al-Anbiya wa ala alihi al-Askiya wa ashabihi al-Atqiya amma ba'd. There was a great scholar by the name of Al-Hatim Al-Asam, rahimahullah ta'ala. A pious person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed with many deep thoughts. We read his words, we read his teachings, and we reflect over them until today. Earlier today I was reading through some sayings and teachings of Hatim al-Asam, rahimahullah. And there was one that really stood out and it fit in very well with the discussion that we're having. So I thought I would start off today's halaqa with a statement of his. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, أَرْبَعَةٌ لَا يَعْرِفُ قَدْرَهَا إِلَّا أَرْبَعَةٌ There are four things. Only four types of people can understand the value of those four things. The first he says, قَدْرُ الشَّبَابِ لَا يَعْرِفُهُ إِلَّا الشُّيُوخِ Only the old people will understand the true value of youth, of a young age. Someone who's young will never understand its true value. You can sit there as a parent and lecture your kids all you want to. You can lecture them all you want to. But they'll only understand the value of young age when they grow. وَقَدْرُ الْعَافِيَةَ لَا يَعْرِفُهُ إِلَّا أَهْلُ الْبَلَاءِ Only sick people understand the value of good health. Only a person who's afflicted, let's not talk about sick people because that's the next one actually. So only a person who's afflicted understands the value of living a life in which you're not stressed, a life in which you're not facing difficulty. There are some of us sitting here right now that aren't going through much in life. Alhamdulillah, life is peaceful for us. It's kind of like in cruise control. You go and ask the people who are facing affliction right now, whose houses have come down, who've lost their property, maybe a business deal went bad and now their life earning has gone down the drain, or someone whose marriage is now broken because of some problem that came up, go and sit with them and they'll say, only if I can be in your shoes. Only if I could be enjoying the afia, the, the security that you have right now. The third people, he says, قَدْرُ السِّحَّةَ لَا يَعْرِفُهَا لَا يَعْرِفُهُ إِلَّا الْمَرْضَى Only the sick people understand, those who are physically sick, only they understand the true value of good health. Sit with someone who might be terminally ill, or maybe someone who, has a made, who had a major injury, or maybe, they've, or maybe they've been sick, you know, maybe from birth, or they've caught something in their life. Sit with them and ask them, what would they do if they were given good health? And I'm telling you, they'll cry and they'll say, only if I had good health like you have. I've shared this story with you before. I was once in Medina Munawwara. It was the month of Ramadan. I arrived in Masjid al-Nabwi a little late, so I couldn't find a place to sit down. I was looking to my left, looking to my right, there was nowhere to sit. I was stuck between people. My arms were pinned against my sides. And the adhan from Maghrib was called and it was time for iftar. I didn't even know where to get a date from because I couldn't reach out anywhere. My arms were pinned to my side. There was a person he kind of slipped a date into my right hand. So I took the date, I said, Bismillah, I ate it. Then I thought to myself, let me see who that person was. So I can say, Jazakallah to him. I turned to my side, and there was this man lying on a stretcher. He was next to me. And this person, by the way, believe it or not, I actually saw him on YouTube before. That video went viral seven, eight years ago, and there were millions of views. If you go to that guy's video today on YouTube, it's like millions and millions of views of his. And this person, when I saw him, I was kind of like starstruck. I was like, oh, it's you? You're the guy that I saw on YouTube. And we're in Majlul Nagwi. So I said, okay, you know what, let's pray Maghrib Salah. After Maghrib, I'll enjoy my moment with him. So after Maghrib Salah was over, I came to him and I said to him, you know, I watched one of your videos on YouTube many years ago. And I remember that your video had me in tears. I sat and I cried after I saw your video. So can you please share the story that you shared in the video with me directly? I want to hear it from you without having a screen between the two of us. So he was a young man, by the way, African. I believe he lived in Jeddah. He said, a group of our friends, we went out one day swimming. I went off the board, I dived into the pool. I didn't realize I was in the shallow end, my head hit the ground. And when they pulled me out of there, my spine was 
injured and damaged, and after that I haven't been able to move myself anymore. I'm, he's on a stretcher. He can move his eyes, maybe speak a few words, move his fingers a little bit. And I said to him, what about what you said on that show? Because on the show, the presenter asked him, what would you do if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you good health? What are some desires that you had you wish you can fulfill? And he started off by saying, Al-Amani, you ask, him, you ask me about my dreams. He said, I wish I can fulfill three dreams of mine. The first, he said, I wish I can use these hands one more time to turn a page of the Qur'an. But that moment is gone. An asjuda lillahi sajda. I wish I can do one more sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I don't think I'm going to get that chance again for the rest of my life either. And he said, the third thing, I wish it would be the day of Eid. And I can come back home, knock on the door, my mother will open it and I can hug her one more time. But today I don't even have the ability to do that anymore. And I kid you not, I sat in Majd al-Nabwi in tears again thinking, this is the value of good health. This person has value today. Why? Because he's lost that wealth. And Hatim al-Assam rahimahullah ta'ala is addressing this exact same thing. And the fourth thing he says, وَقَدْرُ الْحَيَاةِ لَا يَعْرِفُهُ إِلَّا الْمَوْتَى Only the dead or those who are at the brink of dying understand the value of life. Otherwise, the rest of us that are alive right now, we have no value for it. Mark my words, a day will come where you will be surrounded by soil. And when you will be lying in that grave alone, you will be angry at yourself. I wish I had used more time doing the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I wish I had used my tongue to do more dhikr of Allah. Because no matter how much you desire to do dhikr in your grave, or do ibadah of Allah in your grave, will you be given that opportunity? Yes or no? No. Because your deeds come to an end. Only the person who's lying in that grave right now, they would do anything in the world to come back to the world. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوْ تَقُولَ حِينَ تَرَ الْعَذَابَ لَوْ أَنَّ لِي كَرَّةً فَأَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ When you see the punishment on the Day of Judgment, you will say to Allah, Ya Allah, give me one more chance to go back to the world and I promise I'll be a good person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Bala, never. Qad ja'at ka ayati. My Quran came to you, my signs came to you, the hujjah was established. You had your opportunity. Wa biha. And you continue to ignore the khutbah that was given to you. You continue to ignore the khatira that was given to you. You just lived in your own world of delusions, even though you knew that death was certain. This is where we started off our last khutbah. Our last khatira, by the way. I started off by saying, one of the few certainties in life without doubt is death. It's a certain thing. But when you lie there on that day, in your grave, you realize that this is going to be a very long, dark, cold moment that you're going to spend with yourself. And a lot of it will be with you being upset with yourself because you did not use the opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. Ya waqifa in the qabri. O man standing at my grave. O person. There was a person who came by the grave and on the grave it was written, Ya waqifa in the qabri. O oh, person looking at my grave, don't stand there in remorse over me. Don't stand here and think, oh man, poor guy there. You're the poor person. Because yesterday I was you and tomorrow you're going to be me. Right? When he was on that show, this person by the way, and he says that I wish I could, I can do a sajda. You know that person I was talking about? He said, I wish I can do sajda. sajda. The people on the, on the panel started crying. And he said to them, you cry today? You're crying? Why didn't you bring those tears to me when I was healthy and tell me to do such that then your tears would have helped me at least? What good are your tears right now that you're crying over my state? And he recited the ayah of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يُكْشَفُ عَنْ سَاقٍ وَيُدْعَوْنَ إِلَى السُّجُودِ فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ On the day of judgment, mankind will be invited to prostrate in front of Allah. Allah will say, do sajda in front of me. But there are some people who will not be given the chance to do sajda on that day. They'll be standing there, but they won't be allowed to do sajda. They'll want to, but they won't be allowed. Why? وَقَدْ كَانُوا يُدَعَوْنَ إِلَى السُّجُودِ وَهُمْ سَالِمُونَ Because when you were healthy, you were invited to sajda in the world, you never came. You were invited to prostrate in front of Allah. When you were healthy in the world, you decided that that wasn't important, and now all of a sudden you're interested in doing, you're interested in doing sajda in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happened now? How have things changed all of a sudden? Utilizing your life while you have it. This is exactly what Hatim al-Assam rahimahullah ta'ala is highlighting. Imam al-Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi, he brings a very beautiful reflection. He says, think of this. The average person sleeps eight hours a day. And Imam Ghazali says, if you sleep eight hours a day, at the age of 60, you've been sleeping for 20 years of your life. 
So do you really have time to waste? Simple fractions. Eight is one-third of 24 hours a day. 20 is one-third of 60 years of your life. Simple fractions right here. If you've been sleeping eight hours a day, you've slept for 20 years of your life, and you want to waste the other, the other 40 years that you're hardly even awake. And then, you know, the ulama, they say, when you're young, you say you want to play. When you're young, you play with kids. And when you become young, then you're distracted. You're distracted with all the distractions that are there. And when you become old, then you become weak. So what part of your life are you even willing to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When you're young, you say, I'm busy playing. When you're in your youth, you say, I'm busy working and I'm busy with my marriage and I'm busy with my kids. When you get old, your body isn't working anymore. Do you even have Allah on your schedule? Are you even interested in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is there even any importance that I'm going to stand in front of Allah one day so I have to prepare to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I shared the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with you before. And I'll share it today again. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ أَحَبَّ لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ لِقَاءَهُ Whoever desires and loves to meet Allah, Allah also desires and loves to meet that person too. وَمَنْ كَرِهَ لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ And the person who hasn't made time for Allah and does not desire to meet Allah, كَرِهَ اللَّهُ لِقَاءَهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has no interest at all in meeting you. One sahabi, when he heard this, he said, our Messenger of Allah, Lay, uh, he said, our Messenger of Allah, that كُلُّنَا نَكْرَهُ الْمَوْتِ Every one of us dislikes death. Who wants to die? I mean, who wants to experience death? Umar radiallahu anhu one day asked another sahabi that described death to me. You've read the books of the, of the Jews. Describe what death is like. And when he gave a description to Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, that the example of it is like so many thorns being poked into the body and then yanked out and the veins, some are cut and some are left open. And the pain that you continue to feel, he gave this very graphic description by the way. I don't feel comfortable sharing all the details. After what I've shared, trust me, there's even more in that narration. And Umar radiallahu anhu at the end sat there and cried. He said, I wish I can leave this world in a state of kafaf. Umar radiallahu anhu saying this. I wish I can leave this world in a state of kafaf. La li wa la ali. State of kafaf means that I'm equal. I don't earn anything, but I, no one has anything against me either. If I can leave this world in a neutral state, I'm happy. And he cried and cried and cried just because of this description. So the Sahabi says, O Messenger of Allah, no one has a desire to die. Death is difficult. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Laysa bidalika, I'm not talking about that. When I say that you should desire to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ said, Walakinna al mu'min, idha tudira, ja'ahu al bashiru min Allah. That when a person, when the believer is on the brink of passing away, when death approaches him, uh, an angel comes with glad tidings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the angel tells him that now is a time for you to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has X, Y, and Z in store for you. All the salah, and all the wudu, and all the Qur'an, all the i'tikaf, all the siyam, your hajj, your umrah. Allah has a great reward stored for you. When he hears all of this, that person then, فَلَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ لِقَاءِ اللَّهِ there is nothing more desirable to that person than to meet Allah because of what Allah has stored for them. And in return, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also pleased with meeting him. And this is what this hadith is actually talking about. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَإِنَّ الْفَاجِرَ أَوْ قَالَ الْكَافِرَ إِذَا حْتُذِرَ Sorry, it's my tongue gets stuck there. جَاءُهُ النَّذِيرُ بِمَا هُوَ صَائِرٌ إِلَيْهِ مِنَ الشَّرِّ فَكَرِهَ لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ فَكَرِهَ اللَّهُ لِقَاءَهُ And when a person who is a disbeliever or a transgressor, when his time of death comes, another angel comes, not with glad tidings, but with a warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an nadir And he tells him that when you die, watch what happens to you. We know of all the crimes you committed. You thought you got away with it, you thought Allah didn't know. مَا يَلْفِذُ مِن قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبُنَا عَتِيدٌ وَإِنَّا عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ Right? Allah says in many places in the Qur'an, right, that every single statement you utter, every thought, every action of yours is noted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that warner, that angel that comes in the form of a warner says to this person that you better be ready because Allah has a lot of punishment ready for you. And that person then fears and says, I don't want to leave the dunya. I'd rather stay here. The dunya was nice to me. I'm not ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in return, the angel says to that person, if you are not ready to meet Allah, and you have no desire to meet Allah, then know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has no desire to meet you.
The Prophet ﷺ said to the companions, Remember death abundantly. Don't make this a Ramadan remembrance. Every day sit down and tell yourself, One day I will leave this world. Am I ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What will actually happen to me? What about my deeds? And I, said, I shared this hadith, I started it last lecture, and I want to finish it off today. The Prophet ﷺ says, When a person passes away, three things follow him to the grave. His family, his wealth, and his good deeds. Two things return back. His family returns back. We, discovered, we, we discussed this last time. And his wealth also returns back. Does any person take wealth with them to the grave? No matter how beautiful your, your coffin is, or how much... Uh, money you put into a, a stone that's going to lie on top of your grave, do you think that's going to help you in any way in front of Allah? Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is interested in your thousand dollar grave? Or ten thousand dollar gravestone or headstone? Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way is interested in you putting a half a million dollar coffin if that's what you want to do when you die? None of these things matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that even if a person brought a whole earth full of gold, a whole earth full of gold, he still wouldn't be given that... that, that that forgiveness from Allah, if he tries to bribe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. يَوَدُّ الْمُجْرِمُ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَفْتَدِي مِنْ عَذَابِ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِبَنِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَأَخِيهِ وَفَصِيلَتِهِ الَّتِي تُؤْوِي وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ What does Allah say after that? After all the bribes he tries to place to Allah on the day of judgment, the criminal, Ya Allah, let me go, Ya Allah, let me go, take my kids in return, take my wealth in return, take this and that in return. At the end of all of that, what does Allah say? Kalla. What does that mean? Never. Innaha lava nazaatal shawa tadruuman adbara wa tawalla. And the ayat become very graphic then in Surah Ma'arij of the punishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved for that person. So preparing ourselves, wealth will also leave behind. And the only thing that will continue with you as your journey continues on from this world to the next, wayabqa amaluhu, your deeds. This is all that's going to remain. Everything else will come to an end. It will all leave you behind. And if you're interested in making an investment, if you really don't want to mess up, spend some time preparing for that next journey. And I'll share one thing, one thing with you as I close off today. And this is the one thing I want you to hold on to. Try to practice this. Let there be one good deed you do every day that is a secret between you and Allah and no one else knows. Every day, do some good deeds that nobody knows about. That's just ikhlas, your sincerity between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Continue to do some good deeds every day. Create consistency. Because every time you do something good, it is noted down by Allah. And you will find it. The Qur'an will come and testify on your behalf on the Day of Judgment. Your fasting will testify on your behalf on the Day of Judgment. Your patience will be light for you in the grave. Surah Baqarah will come and testify for you. Surah Mulk will come and testify for you. These are all ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you fulfill your promise to the Qur'an, the Qur'an will never ever fail you. If you fulfill your promise to Salah, Salah will never fail you. You fulfill your promise to Salm. What does it mean fulfilling your promise? You do it properly, wholeheartedly, the way it should be done. All of these things that we're talking about that sound like just boring, you know, annoying things to do, it's all gonna come back one day. Every time someone stands in front of you here and says to you, give in the path of Allah, by Allah give. Even if it's just 50 cents or a dollar, give something. Because trust me, that 50 cents or dollar is going to come back. You're thinking to yourself at that time, that I don't need to give. Because, you know, what is my one dollar going to do? I came to the masjid without any interest in giving. I came here for taraweeh prayer. These people keep asking for money again and again. You know, your heart is saying, don't do it. But every time when you make a firm intention, you're not going to do something, but then you do the exact opposite to impress Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy, it's those moments that take the highest place in your record of deeds, and you will be pleased to see them on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تحقرن No, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَلَوْ بِشِقِّ tamra. I'm forgetting the first part of the hadith. اِتَّقُ النَّارِ وَلَوْ بِشِقِّ tamra. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Save yourself from the fire of hell with every good deed, even if it means for you to give not even a full date in sadaqah, but a part of a date in sadaqah. How much is a part of a date? How much would, how much would a one date cost? A few cents? Yes or no? Ten cents? Five cents? I don't know, I am just never did the, did the math. If you were to do half a date, how much is that equal to? Three, four cents? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, اِتَّقُ النَّارِ وَلَوْ بِشَقِّ tamra." 
Give that and still protect yourself from the fire of hell. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq, gives us guidance, gives us understanding, opens our eyes and guides the path to the guides us to the path that he will be pleased with and that will bring us to the greatest abode in the hereafter. Wa sallallahu ta'ala wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.